Oh, hi. You caught me gnawing on raw meat. Speaking of acting like a barbarian, let's talk about Gru the Wanderer. Hello! Welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. Today's topic was selected by one of my patrons, Keith Stoll. It's about a book I read growing up, and I still love today, Grew the Wander. Now, this is actually a little bit of a tricky topic to cover, because it's about humor. And humor is subjective. I've learned over the past, what, I don't know, 150 episodes or so, I might tell a joke and I'm hoping for a <laughs> type reaction, but I'll settle for a Hmm. My point is, when it comes to humor, different people react differently. It's tough to convince somebody that something is funny. But I'm going to give it a shot anyway, because Gru is fantastic. There's several areas that I can address. I can talk about the history of its creator, Sergio Aragonis. I can talk about how the book has evolved across five different publishers. And we can address the specific type of humor that it employs, which is farce. Let's start by digging into Sergio Aragonés history. Sergio Aragonés was born in Spain in 1937, but his family quickly emigrated to France to escape the Spanish Civil War. By age six, they had moved to Mexico, where he was raised. Sergio was constantly drawing from the time he was a child and grew up in an artistic family. His father directed film and television, including the 1955 syndicated series Sheena, Queen of the Jungle, based on the comic book by Will Eisner and Jerry Iger. Side note, Sheena was actually the first female comic book character to have her own title in 1937. Ooh. Sergio was once drafted by his father to dress up in the costume and wig to do a long-distance shot of swinging on a vine when a stuntman didn't show up. He later studied pantomime at the National Autonomous University of Mexico under avant-garde director and later comic book writer Alejandro Jodorowsky. Sergio's training in pantomime informed a lot of his later comic strips because he makes gags that are wordless. He figured out very early on how to find the core of a joke physically, and he can represent that in his illustrations. It's pretty impressive stuff. Sergio was at university to study architecture, but his passion lay in drawing cartoons. And without any good options for him in Mexico, he moved to New York City in 1962. While working odd jobs and looking for opportunities to show his art, people recommended to him that he pitch his work to Mad Magazine. He showed up and decided to ask to see the only Spanish-speaking cartoonist he knew worked there, Antonio Projaes, the creator of Spy vs. Spy. However, it turned out Projaes spoke even less English than Aragones, and Projaes' enthusiastic introduction led the editors to initially think Sergio was Antonio's brother. Mad editor Al Feldstein and publisher Bill Gaines loved what they saw and hired Aragonis right away, telling him to make Mad his home. Aragonis began creating a series called A Mad Look At, and covering whatever topics interested him, from coffee to comic book conventions. His other big contribution was tiny gag cartoons drawn in the margins and gutters of various pages of the magazine, which were termed marginals. From 1963 to today, Aragonis' work has appeared in every issue except for one where the artwork was lost due to postal error. Also in the 60s, Sergio began working at DC Comics, illustrating stories for Adventures of Jerry Lewis and Angel and the Ape. He also helped them co-create the western hero Bat Lash and their humor magazine Plop. But he started to get frustrated because the editors there wouldn't even start to discuss him publishing a story and retaining the rights to it. One time, when he balked at a work-for-hire contract, the editor simply tore up his paycheck in front of his face. So Sergio walked. By the late 70s, Sergio had visited Europe, and he was fascinated with how their comic book artists usually retained the rights to their creations, and also that they were creating a lot more humor titles than were found in the U.S. 
Sergio decided one thing he wasn't seeing much of was a humor comic book, and specifically thought to make the dumb barbarian Gru, but couldn't find a publisher that let him keep the rights until 1982 when he met with Pacific Comics. Pacific Comics was one of the early indie publishers in the 1980s that was successful by taking advantage of selling directly to comic book stores, just avoiding the newsstands completely and selling directly to comic book stores. Uh, in 1971, brothers Bill and Steve Shanes formed Pacific as a mail-order comic book service. It was so successful that by 1974, they had physical Pacific comic book stores in like the San Diego area, and by 1979 they decided to launch their own publishing empire. They attracted a lot of top talent, they ended up publishing Gru, uh, but they didn't last that long. By 1984 they were basically edged out by growing competition, so they only lasted four or five years as a publisher. Sergio launched an eight-issue series called Gru the Wanderer at Pacific in December of 1982. Prior to that, the character had appeared in a four-page story in the 1981 book Destroyer Duck by Eclipse Comics. That was an anthology book by creators Jack Kirby and Steve Gerber, created to help raise funds as Steve Gerber fought a lawsuit with Marvel Comics where he tried to get the rights to his creation Howard the Duck back. Gru also appeared in some pages in Pacific Comic Book Star Slayers number 4 and 5. The first page of Gru is actually a satirical biography of Sergio explaining his dreams of owning his comic creation before the story of Gru begins. Sergio gathered a team to help support him on the Gru comic, including writer Mark Evanier to help script and develop Sergio's ideas after Sergio plotted out the idea for each issue. Next, artist Stan Sakai, best known as the creator of Usagi Yojimbo, letters the book. Aragonis then returns to ink the work and illustrate the word balloons, followed by Tom Luth laying down the colors. This is the same team that's been working on every single issue until today, totaling nearly 200 numbered issues, specials, and graphic novels. The character of Gru is an incredibly dumb barbarian, whose one skill is that he is an undefeatable swordsman. It was very much a parody of the popular Conan comics at the time. The self-published comic Cerebus by Dave Sim was a similar idea, a mean-spirited aardvark barbarian, whose comic began in 1977. But by the time Gru debuted, Cerebus had moved in a more long-form literary direction, so the market to parody medieval-esque fantasy was wide open. Sergio's art style was well developed by 1982, so the look of Gru and the book itself has not changed too drastically. If anything, Gru is a bit looser in the early issues, but it's only noticeable with a direct comparison. However, he is written as dim-witted, but not nearly as stupid as he would become. In fact, in issue 8, Gru actually comes up with a plan to sneak inside an enemy's castle with a Trojan horse. Just a couple years later, Gru could never be capable of even the most basic plan. His stupidity knows no depths. That stupidity is at the core of the central joke of every story in Gru. Basically, Gru ruins everything he touches. Everything he comes across is ruined, whether that's sinking a ship, or destroying a town's finances, or destroying an army or two. Uh, Gru ruins everything he touches, but the real fools are the people that try to exploit Gru, whether that's because of pride or greed or laziness. So the joke is sort of on them. No matter what, it will all culminate in total destruction. So the type of comedy I said that Gru covers, that's farce. Let's talk about that. Farce is a heightened or exaggerated look at the world, one that features absurd events, buffoonery, and slapstick. It features characterizations and improbable situations. That's what Gru is every time, just like other comedies that deal in farce, from The Taming of the Shrew by William Shakespeare to a sitcom like Frasier. It just builds on the characters' mistakes until everything collapses under a stack of lies that the characters can't keep up with. In Gru, he'd come across characters like Arcadio, a fellow warrior who is always thought of as a hero and who thinks of himself as the best hero of all time. Or Pal and Drum, a pair of con men who try to use Gru in their plans and are constantly left in ruins for their efforts. Toronto is a corrupt general whose plans to conquer are constantly undone by Gru accidentally. Some characters are more benevolent, like the Sage or the Minstrel, 
but anyone who gets close to Gru usually ends up poor, injured, or in prison. The sole exception is his dog, Referto. Referto was introduced in issue 29 of Gru's second run. We're constantly privy to his thoughts, and Referto looks up to Gru as a great warrior and a good friend. After Gru's eight issues at Pacific Comics, there was a plan for a special issue advertised in that eighth issue. But Pacific went out of business and sold their inventory of upcoming comics, including the special, to fellow independent publisher Eclipse, who published that issue. After that, Marvel approached Sergio to use their new creator-owned imprint Epic to continue his title. Epic was formed by editor Jim Shooter in 1982 to allow big-name creators a place to publish and retain the rights to their creation while still maintaining a relationship with Marvel. Early titles included Dread Star by Jim Starlin, Coyote by Steve Englehart, and Alien Legion by Karl Potts. Epic later expanded to include fantasy titles like ElfQuest by Richard and Wendy Peeney and Humor by Adding Gru. It was also an early publisher for foreign comics like Mobius's French comic Airtight Garage and Katsuhiro Otomo's classic manga Akira. Gru's run at Epic Comics lasted 120 monthly issues, as well as two original graphic novels, 1987's The Death of Gru and 1993's The Life of Gru. Topics would range from war to technology to entertainment. No matter what, though, you always knew what you'd get in an issue of Gru, and it was always a self-contained funny story. Beyond the hilarious slapstick, it is worth noting the detail found within Sergio Aragonis's artwork. While characters are cartoonish, with big bellies and spindly legs, he will draw an incredible amount of line work to include dozens or hundreds of background characters. Beyond that, his architecture and work on real-world objects like ships are surprisingly detailed. The impression might be that the comic is sketchy, but a more careful look reveals that it will be illustrated with lush, vibrant environments with painstaking accuracy for things like musical instruments or vegetation. It's easy to miss, but it's all part of Aragonis delivering an immersive experience. His quick line work on characters imparts a lively energy that gives characters personality and keeps the speed of the story fast, the better to hit you with dozens of puns, visual gags, and slapstick action scenes. Sergio is known as an incredibly fast artist. Obviously, he's able to keep up with a monthly comic book, his obligations to MAD, and then he'll do other projects on top of that. But the amazing thing about how fast he works is the stories that come out of that. Uh, people will say how, at conventions, he can bang out a commission in mere moments. There's a story of one time when a fan said, why am I paying you so much for a drawing that you did so fast. And Sergio explained, you're not paying me for how fast I did this drawing. You're paying me for all the years it took me to get that fast. Marvel began facing financial difficulties in the 90s and closed the epic imprint in 1994. Gru moved over to Image Comics for one year, putting out 12 issues. The creators took a small break for the first time and then moved to Dark Horse Comics, who currently publish Gru. At this point, Gru doesn't publish monthly, but will instead put out four-issue story arcs when the creators feel like it. That said, in the 20 years since the book has been at Dark Horse, Gru has had nine four-issue series, a 12-issue maxi-series, and a 25th anniversary special. One highlight of the Dark Horse run was the crossover comic Gru vs. Conan. Dark Horse had the rights to Conan at the time, and the idea of having the two barbarians meet was too fun to pass up. That said, it took Sergio about seven years to crack the story and come up with a workable idea. Neither warrior could really be the loser of a battle, but Sergio came across a solution when he rewatched director Akira Kurosawa's classic film, Rashomon, which tells the same story from different points of view. With that idea in place, the four-issue series came out in 2014 to great reviews. In my opinion, the only significant difference that's occurred over time is really just the quick evolution of Gru into a dumber character in that first year or so, and then in more recent years, especially since the book went to Image and Dark Horse, the evolution of Tom Luth's coloring techniques as he begins to use 
digital art techniques. So that part has perhaps evolved a little bit. But aside from that, it's remarkably well formed right from the beginning. And because it's not set in the present day, the stories are timeless. It's hilarious. You could pick up any issue, any story of Gru, you're gonna get a laugh. I am a big fan. I picked up this original art, I'm gonna zoom in there, from Sergio one time. I paid a good amount for it, and I don't regret it at all. I am a massive fan. I love staring at that original art, looking at the sort of erased pencil lines, seeing where he put in his inks, kind of trying to get a sense of how fast he put it together. I don't know, it just sort of fascinates me to think about. Uh, IDW recently put out an artist's edition of Sergio's Gru work, so you can sort of see the steps that it goes between from penciling to inking and so on. It's pretty interesting. I definitely recommend Gru. And you know what? Like, you could pick up any issue and understand what the story is. You don't have to start at the beginning and continue forward. Yes, there are recurring gags that will form at some point, like Gru loving cheese dip or hating being called a mendicant because he doesn't understand what that word means. But that's only sort of an added bonus if you're a regular reader. You're definitely going to appreciate the art and get a laugh no matter what issue you pick up. So that's my recommendation to you. Go out and find a Gru issue if you haven't read one yet. And if you do love it, I hope you appreciated this look at Sergio's career and some of the evolution of that book. That said, it's the end of the episode. Let's take a look at what fan art I got this week. I received three pieces of fan art this week, starting with this beautiful little pixelated Infotron robot by Octavia Rowe. I think this thing is adorable. Thank you so much, Octavia. Next up is this piece by Luis Saavedra, and it looks like it's me, Infotron, and oh yeah, two more Infotrons. I'm really glad that people love my ridiculous robot character that makes the occasional appearance. This is a really exciting piece, Luis. And finally, there's this piece by Eric Rivera, showing me deep in thought as I read one of apparently hundreds of comics that I own. All right, now we're going to see who of these three wins the Gachapon prize. There are their names, three pieces of paper. I'm going to drop them in the bag full of Gachapons. I'm going to reach in a couple times. I'm just sort of shaking it about. And the winner is Eric. Eric Rivera wins this week. Eric, I'll get your address. I'll send you out a Gachapon. Which Gachapon? Well, let's take a look. If you would like to have your fan art featured, just make sure that it's something to do with this channel and send it to this email address, comictropes at gmail.com. And if you want me to include something like your social media profile or, um, you know, a website, include that as well. All right, this looks like it might be a sushi cat, a, a cat on a piece of sushi. I don't know how well you can make that out. Can you sort of see that? So that's what Eric won. Very Japanesey. I picked all of these up myself in Japan. And, uh, you know, just thank you, everybody, for watching. Um, Oh my gosh, I've gotten so many wonderful pieces of support on Twitter lately. Uh, there's a bunch of professional artists and people in the entertainment industry that have tremendous followings that have been sharing and retweeting episodes lately. So that's really appreciated. I'm, I'm very flattered. Thank you so much for that. Um, but you know what? Like, if you're watching and you're like, well, I only have a hundred Twitter followers, does that make me less valuable? No, not at all. Every view means something to me. It all helps. I'm getting a lot of wonderful uh, words of support. Uh, people send me messages, and um, it all helps. It, it helps make it worth it, you know, because you don't want to feel like you're making a show and you're just throwing it out into the void and it's just an echo, you know? Uh, you want to hear back from people. And I know that I don't get everything right, you know? I mispronounce names sometimes because I've only read them. Or I don't include every bit of history because, you know, I'm looking for you to discover a little bit yourself. So people, like, correct me, and some of that's appreciated. You know, some of it is not appreciated, but some of it is very appreciated. I love constructive criticism. I can use feedback. Um, I don't always read the comments in YouTube these days, but stuff on social media I'll generally take a look at, as well as any sort of private messages and emails. So I take a close look at all that. All right, that's plenty of rambling from me. Hope you enjoyed this look at Gru, and until next week, keep reading comics.